Good to be with you, friends. Pastor Steve at Richland Lutheran Church. We're in the Gospel of Matthew, looking at the kingdom of God. And um, I think maybe I need to apologize <laughs> for yesterday's devotion. I feel like I just vomited almost everything um, that I wanted to communicate with you. I, I talked fast. I, uh, I didn't pause much. I gave you a ton of information. And uh, sorry about that. You might be feeling a little overwhelmed as we begin our study of the kingdom of God, or as Matthew calls it most often, the kingdom of heaven. But what yesterday evidenced in me <laughs> and to you is that this is something that I'm totally passionate about, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And I've talked a little bit about the reason why, namely because Jesus talked about it the most in his preaching and teaching, but all the more I find my passion in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, because that's the sweet spot where the Christian disciple, the Christian who's being formed, where Christian growth happens in the individual is in the kingdom of God, number one. Number two, because the kingdom of the world uh, is at odds with the kingdom of God, I find it all the more important to keep the kingdom of God forefront and most important in my mind. And number three, there's been a, a, uh, an amalgamation, a, a conflation, especially here in the West, between the two kingdoms. And so I'm feeling all the more, especially in our day and age with how things are unfolding, not only in the West and in the United States, but worldwide, that we have to get back to, we the church has to get back to understanding and living in the kingdom of God. In the first century, there was a clear delineation between two kingdoms. And so we find Jesus living in the first century and, and then the early church coming kind of into its own in the first century. And so when Jesus starts to preach the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of the world was not really in view of especially Israel, they were at odds with the kingdom of the world. They were really receptive to the kingdom of God. We've lost that, I think, receptiveness. We've certainly lost the idea that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world are two separate kingdoms uh, in which we live kind of different lives. And I want to grab a book, if I can find it here real quick, on the kingdom of God. I mentioned it to you, and I read from it not long ago. And of course, I'm not finding it uh, when I need it. Uh, let's see where it went. Here we go. All right. So I, I read this quote to you, uh, let's see, probably two weeks ago now, when we were talking about the kingdom of God in the Gospel of Luke by Howard Snyder. It was called The Community of the King. And I want to read it to you again as kind of entree then into our scripture text today. And as we're talking about the importance, I think, of the division, at least keeping our kingdoms separate, uh, Howard Snyder postulates, I would say, um, in his writing, he writes, is it good news when the church succeeds? A theologian once wrote, and that theologian is Otto Friesling, he was uh, an apologist. He, he gave defense of the faith for the Holy Roman Empire in the 12th century. So this was written in the 12th century. A theologian once wrote, speaking frankly, I do not really know whether the current prosperous condition of the church is more pleasing to God than its earlier humility. That earlier condition was perhaps better, but the present one is more agreeable. And I think what Friesling was getting at is that 
the church in the first century, when it was in opposition, clear opposition to the kingdom of, of the world, found great growth, and found uh, uh, great depth. Uh, we found the people who were uh, committed greatly to discipleship and to the church. But in the 12th century, when the church was the church of the state, the Holy Roman Empire still, um, Friesling is questioning, is this has been good for the growth and vitality for the health of the church? And I think his answer would be, it has not. So we ask that question of us today. Snyder continues, does a quote success, end quote, of the church at various points in history caused uneasiness, which joined with a new vision of its earlier days prompted resentment, reform, and even renewal. The Protestant Reformation, of which we are well acquainted as Lutherans, is the most well-known of several such times. Again, in our day, Jesus' followers might do well to ponder the contrast between the seeming prosperity of the present and the humility of the first century Christian community. Now, these are perhaps hard words to understand and digest, but here's the gist. I think what Snyder is arguing and using Friesling as a resource and illustration thereof is the church seems to advance, be healthier, uh, grow when we find that uh, we must be humble when our kingdoms are divided, when we're not finding the conflation, the amalgamation of the two kingdoms in the 12th century, in the 14th century, in the time of Martin Luther, and maybe even now in the 21st century. Because we mix those kingdoms up, I think it would be the, the final assessment of Snyder. So now with that kind of his background and context, let's go to Matthew chapter four and verses 12 through 17. This is the beginning of Jesus preaching ministry. So some background, uh, Jesus has just been baptized uh, in the River Jordan. He was sent out by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by Satan, three temptations. And now Jesus begins his public ministry. Matthew 4, 12. When Jesus heard that John, John the Baptist, we talked about him yesterday, had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. So he moves north from Jerusalem. Leaving Nazareth, Jesus went and lived in Capernaum. So again, north from Nazareth, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. This lake is Lake Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee. In verse 14, here's a purpose statement. Jesus left Nazareth, went to Capernaum, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. And now Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near from the very beginning of jesus public ministry jesus has made clear and matthew makes this very clear as well here in matthew 4 that he was all about the kingdom of heaven namely that it was near it had come and it was continuing to come. We experience that same kingdom today that came with the public ministry of Jesus. And Jesus then preached this kingdom to the people. And as evidence of the coming of the kingdom of God, 
Matthew connects Jesus' words and ministry actions to Isaiah's prophecy captured in chapter 9. And it's quite remarkable that Isaiah foretold tens of thousands of years, most likely, this prophetic ministry of Jesus. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea. What sea is that? The sea of Galilee, Lake Gennesaret, beyond the Jordan. So the Sea of Galilee is east of the Jordan. Um, we would call that Transjordan and not west of it. Um, west of the Jordan was the promised land, Canaan, and south. Uh, Galilee was Transjordan or east of it. Um, beyond the Jordan is how um, Isaiah prophesied. So Galilee of the Gentiles. This is the exact place now where Jesus begins his public ministry proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. Uh, then verse 16. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. What Matthew is interpreting, and I think correctly from Isaiah, this prophetic utterance of Isaiah, is that now the people of Galilee, who are not considered in the promised land, have received the kingdom of God. And this is somewhat remarkable in that the Messiah was expected to predominantly be in the promised land, in Jerusalem. And yet Jesus begins his ministry on the margins with the minimal, minimal, minimized, <laughs> easy for me to say. So this is what I want us to consider today. And again, you can tell I'm, I'm passionate. And I'm excited about the kingdom of God, but that's this. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven first came to those unexpected folk who were minimized and marginalized. In fact, it's quite shocking and would be to the Jew that Jesus began this ministry, the ushering in of the kingdom of God in Galilee. Nothing good came from Galilee and all the more from Nazareth. And yet, these are the ones the kingdom of God goes to first. Jesus unveils to them first. Think about that. And what a gift that is to those who are minimized and marginalized. All right. I know I'm past time as it is. We better pray. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow for another great study in the kingdom of God. So God, we pray. We, we are grateful that your kingdom has come, that your kingdom is coming, and that your kingdom will come in its fulfillment. Lord, help us to contemplate today as we consider the coming of your kingdom, that it first came to Galilee and prophesied by Isaiah, this unusual, unremarkable, unexpected place to those who are, are marginalized, minimized. Thank you that though we may feel marginalized or minimized, you have come to us Help us to be in the right space and place today as we consider your kingdom. And help us, God, to, to keep our kingdoms separated and straight. Help us to be about your kingdom, Lord. And be willing to give up the kingdom of the world. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Hey, great study. I hope you're, you're going to catch this passion for the kingdom of God that uh, Jesus, I think, holds and passes on to those of us who have the blessing and the grace of living in it. God bless you. Miss you. Hope to see you soon. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.